Hi there, and welcome to this video on A-level biology for the AQA specification, focusing on the topic of genetic information, variation and relationships, and in particular, on DNA and protein synthesis. I'm Manisha from StudyMind, where we help you to revise A-level biology with our helpful video tutorials tailored to your subject, your specification, and to you. If you're new here, please make sure to click that subscribe button. And whilst you're watching, feel free to leave any comments down below of anything you're unsure about, and let us know if it's your first time watching, so we can send you our free revision resources. We also have helpful timestamps to guide you through the specification. So, let's get started. Welcome to lesson two of eight in this tutorial, covering DNA and protein synthesis. This is the second lesson in our series of eight videos covering the topic of DNA and genes. In the last lesson, we looked at DNA, genes and chromosomes. Here are the key learning objectives for today's lesson. First, we'll be looking at transcription and translation, then at base sequences and amino acids. Here are the AQA learning objectives for this tutorial. Feel free to pause the video now and have a quick read through them before we begin. We'll start off by looking at transcription. Protein synthesis is the process by which the base sequence in genes is used to make polypeptides. It's useful to understand how we go from genes to characteristics. We spoke about alleles in the last tutorial, which are essentially different versions of genes. The gene has a specific sequence of bases which is used to make the protein chain. The proteins of the body determine these characteristics. To begin with, let's just recap what we learnt last time. The information to code amino acids and make proteins is in DNA. However, protein synthesis occurs in ribosomes. The DNA is too big to move out of the nucleus, so how does this information get to the ribosome in the first place? Well, the DNA makes a copy of itself, known as messenger RNA or mRNA. This mRNA can leave the nucleus and travel to the ribosome, where amino acids are made for protein synthesis. Now that we know how we get the information from the nucleus to ribosomes, it's important to learn the two stages of protein synthesis, transcription and translation. During transcription, a strand of mRNA is made. This is a copy of all the codons needed to make a polypeptide. This mRNA diffuses out of the nucleus to the ribosomes. During translation, the mRNA travels to the ribosome and attaches to it. Here, it makes the final protein. Protein synthesis occurs in two major phases, as we've just mentioned. The first is transcription, where an mRNA strand is synthesized from a particular gene template. The next is translation, where the mRNA attaches to the ribosome, which recruits tRNAs, carrying amino acids, in order to make a polypeptide. To recap, we start off with the DNA molecule, which contains lots of genes. One part of the gene may code for a protein. The DNA template strand is used to make the mRNA. Remember, the key enzyme is RNA polymerase 2. mRNA is made, which is complementary to the DNA. Notice how the A and U are pairs, and the C and G are pairs. So, the first base of the DNA is A, so the complementary base is U, not T, as RNA doesn't have thymine. The second DNA base is C, so the complementary base is G on the mRNA. We'll now look more closely at the role of RNA polymerase. 
The first stage is that the transcription factor will bind to the promoter region of a particular gene. RNA polymerase adds complementary RNA nucleotides to a template DNA strand. The formed RNA strand is identical to the other coding DNA strand, except that the U is substituted for T. Nucleotides are only added to the 3' end of the RNA molecule. Next, DNA helicase unwinds the gene region. It does this by breaking the hydrogen bonds between the two DNA strands. This exposes the bases on each strand. The two unwound strands of DNA are referred to as the coding strand or the template strand. Then, enzyme RNA polymerase binds in a region just before the start codon of the gene. Now, RNA polymerase transcribes the mRNA. RNA polymerase reads the nucleotides on the unwound DNA template strand. It then recruits nucleotides and continually makes an RNA strand. The growing mRNA strand lengthens in the 5' to 3' direction. Eventually, RNA polymerase reaches the stop codon, which stops transcribing mRNA. Finally, the resulting strand of RNA is known as pre-mRNA. The pre-mRNA will have the same sequence as the coding strand, except all the T's will be replaced by U's. Here is a small diagrammatic overview. Let's just quickly recap the seven stages. First, we have the binding of the transcription factor to the promoter regions of the particular genes. Then the DNA helicase unwinds the gene region. We then get the binding of enzyme RNA polymerase, which will transcribe the mRNA. Next, the RNA polymerase will reach the stop codon and the resulting strand of RNA is known as pre-mRNA. Now let's look at RNA transcription. RNA polymerase binds to the template strand and transcribes pre-mRNA. This will have the same sequence as the coding strand. Although there are many different types of RNAs with many different functions, mRNA is one of the most important, despite only accounting for 10% of the total RNA content. It's made in the nucleus during transcription with the nucleotides U, A, C and G. Here, we can see a pictorial representation of the transcription. Next, we'll be looking at transcription in the production of DNA from mRNA. Now let's look at post-transcription slicing. In prokaryotes, transcription directly leads to an mRNA. But in eukaryotes, transcription makes pre-mRNA, which then has to be spliced to make mRNA. The pre-mRNA needs to be modified before leaving the nucleus and travel to the ribosomes. The greatest risk to mRNA comes from enzymes known as exonucleases and endonucleases. These are enzymes which destroy nucleic acids and defend against viral infections. They cannot discriminate between viral nucleic acids and mRNA so may just attack normal mRNA. To prevent this destruction, two major modifications are made. The first is a 5' cap, and the second is a poly-A tail. The 5' end of the mRNA can be altered to produce this 5' cap. This protects the mRNA from nucleases and is required for it to bind to ribosomes. The poly-A tail essentially means that lots of adenines are added to the pre 3 prime end, which protects it from nucleases. It also facilitates the exit of mRNA from the nucleus through nuclear pores. When it comes to translation and transcription, you can often get a long answer question. 
so including the functions of a poly A tail and 5 prime cap will raise you to an A star level. The pre-mRNA contains both exons and introns. The pre-mRNA transcribed by the RNA needs to have the introns removed. This way, the final mRNA only has the exons which contain the codons for the ribosomes to be read. Splicing is carried out by specialised proteins that form a structure, known as the spliceosome. The spliceosome recognises where an intron starts and where it ends. They attach to this region and cut them out of the pre-mRNA, joining the exons together. Following the 5' prime capping, the poly-A tail formation and splicing, we finally form an mRNA, which is ready to travel out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm to bind to the ribosome. Splicing does not take place in prokaryotes, since they do not have introns. Next, we'll be looking at translation, which produces polypeptides from a sequence of codons. Now we're on to step two, translation. We have an mRNA which is diffused out of the nucleus and is heading towards a ribosome. During translation, mRNA will dock at the ribosomes. The ribosomes read codons on the mRNA and bring tRNAs with the complementary codon. For example, if the codon on the mRNA is AUG, the ribosome brings a tRNA that has an anticodon reading UAC. So here, the first tRNA would be ACC and would bring the correct amino acid bait for this base code. Notice that ACC is the same as the original DNA code. mRNA can then bind to the ribosome. This is helped by the 5' prime cap of the mRNA, which the ribosome can bind to. The poly-A tail binds to the ribosome to increase translational efficiency. The ribosome reads the codons on the mRNA, beginning with the start codon AUG. Amino acids are found in the cytoplasm. This is an ATP-driven process. As the start codon is AUG, the first amino acid will be methionine, brought by a tRNA with the anticodon UAC. The ribosome continues to read the next codon and another tRNA brings the correct amino acid. A peptide bond can then form between the two amino acids. An enzyme called aminoacyltransferase catalyzes this. A second tRNA takes its place. The process is repeated for each codon that the ribosome reads. Stop codons are either UAA, UGA or UAG. tRNAs do not have anticodons for stop codons. Terminating factor catalyzes the hydrolysis of the bonds between the final tRNA and the amino acid chain, which then releases the polypeptide chain. After translation, the polypeptide chains are folded, which is a spontaneous process, but is also guided along by specialised proteins. The polypeptides can also undergo post-translational modifications. For example, carbohydrate chains can be added onto proteins, depending on the type of protein and its function. Also, all polypeptide chains start with methionine, but in some proteins, this can be cleaved off following translation. Proteins that need to be secreted from the cell are translated and folded into the rough ER. Ribosomes can recognise if a protein is meant to be secreted. If so, the ribosomes attach themselves to the RER and translate it along the polypeptide chain. 
They are then sent to the Golgi apparatus. Proteins meant for use inside the cell will stay in the cytoplasm. Here are the steps of translation again. First, the mRNA will bind to the ribosome which reads the first codons. Then, the tRNA brings the complementary amino acid for the first codon, and a second one is brought soon after. A peptide bond can then form, and the first tRNA will leave as it's released from the ribosome. The ribosomes will carry on doing this until the stop codon is reached. We can then fold the polypeptide chains and modify them after translation. Finally, the proteins leave to their final destinations. Those leaving the cell will go to the rough ER, whilst those that stay in the cell will go to the cytoplasm. Here are those 11 steps again. This is a good summary diagram. Again, we've gone into lots of detail here. It isn't too complicated, so do try to memorise it all. But if you have a long answer question asking about the process of translation, you may not get the time or space to write every single thing down. Finally, we'll be looking at nucleic acids and their relationship to the genetic code. There are some basic binding rules that you should remember. A binds to T and C binds to G in DNA. In RNA, A binds to U, but C still binds to G. In your AQA exams, you may get a question which involves relating the base sequence of nucleic acids to the amino acid sequence of polypeptides. Here is an extract from an AQA question. Remember, codons are degenerate. Each of the 20 amino acids used to make proteins can be specified by more than one codon. In this diagram, the mutation 1 DNA sequence would still make glycine as the second amino acid despite the change from GCC to GGA. The mutation has been silent in this case. It has no effect on the overall polypeptide. DNA has ATCG and RNA has AUCG. It's important to remember that DNA doesn't have uracil and RNA doesn't have arginine. Also, remember tRNA are anticodons. They may ask you to give the mRNA at codon and state the complementary tRNA anticodon. If the mRNA codon is GCA, then the tRNA anticodon is CGU. Also, codons contain three bases. In this diagram, the original DNA sequence can be broken down into codons. You can work out the amino acids produced by looking at the bases in sets of three. We've now covered all the learning objectives for today's lesson. Feel free to skip back through the video and re-watch anything you're unsure about. We've now completed Lesson 2. If you enjoyed this tutorial, make sure to subscribe by clicking down below and leaving a comment of the topic that you'd like to see a video on. Click here to watch the rest of our videos in our A-Level Biology series, or visit our website, studymind.co.uk, for past paper compilations by topic and specification.